I drank all day in London with my new homies Brad and Johnny. Our last stop was a cask beer pub where they told me all about warm, flat beer. I may have passed out. Welcome. <laughs> Johnny Herbos. Johnny, we've arrived. Best pub in the world. Let's do this. Let me get these. Yeah. Let me get these. No, we'll get these. Let me get these. We'll get these. I'll, I'll get these. Jesus. Mm, I want this. No, it's got to be cask. But I want this. It's got to be cask. We're here to talk about cask. Okay. Brad, it's your world. We're just loving it, man. Get what you want. <laughs> Four Giles, please. We could have started with that. <laughs> so this is called the Jarl. J A R L. Okay. So 3.8% Citra Pale Ale from Scotland. First of all, I want to thank you guys, all of you, for taking time out of your busy schedule, day drinking schedule, to do <laughs> some more day drinking with me. It's not really much of a change, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. I guess before I ask you some questions, I want to know if you could just tell me, like, at a very high level, what is cask beer and how does it differ from what people would just generally know as beer. The big difference with Carl's Gale is you've got to think about it like it's kind of the fresh bread of beer. So it's beer that is only just finished conditioning, fermenting, carbonating That's at the nice moment beer. that you drink it. Yeah. So rather than just brew a beer, ferment a beer, carbonate a beer, package it, instead you brew a beer, ferment a beer most of the way, then you package it and let it finish carbonating itself. So you get natural carbonation, so the CO2 is produced by that fermentation process. And then it means that you can send it to the pub or rack it in your tap room. And as soon as it's ready, bang, you can put it on. So in theory, it's about as fresh as beer can get. Sure. But it then relies on you, A, serving it at its freshest and B, looking after it and drinking it quickly. Yeah, so there's more of a partnership between the brewery and the server than a traditional beer would be. I say by traditional beer, I mean like the beer that we know today, which is just kegged beer. Really when this is more of a traditional order style of beer. But you know, kegged beer is really just plug and play. That you put it on tap, you hook your CO2 up to it and you're ready to go. But but with cask beer, there's some nurturing that happens by the bartender or the bar or the pub that it's served at before it's actually served to the public. Yeah, I mean, in the UK, we have like pubs that you know are good for cask ale and there's pubs that you know aren't so good for cask ale because right. they have to look after it right. They have to store it at the right temperatures, which is true of a lot of keg beer as well. They have to serve it when they know that it's at its peak. So the point that they vent it, which is when they let the excess CO2 out that's built up. So they'll, they'll put a pin in it that will let a little bit of gas out. They'll know when the carbonation's right. They'll know when it's dropped clear or what's known as dropped bright. And that's when it's gonna look its best, taste its best and be its freshest. So it's about the, the, the publican knowing when a beer is at its best and putting it on them. And that takes a, you know, like subjective skill in terms of knowing when a beer is good yeah. and experience of caring for these beers, but it also takes planning as well. Because if you've got six pumps of cask ale, you need to know when that's going to finish so that you vent the next at the right time so it's in peak condition. Mm. So yeah, it's a real kind of logistical oh, thing. Um, and then like the little, the pin that they push in the cask to vent it, it's called a spile or? Yes, well, yeah. The idea will be that you'll be able to let excess CO2 out, and then as you pull the beer out of that cask, you'll let a little bit of oxygen in to replace that so you can actually physically pull it out. So that's why you have to serve cask beer really quickly yeah. because you're letting oxygen in with each draw, and obviously, oxygen yeah. is really bad for beer. And yeah. so, within the general rule, is within 72 hours. But if you want it to taste like the brewer intended, you want to do it quicker. But you know, different breweries are better at producing sort of oxygen proof beers and it depends on the style. And also you can now get spirals that won't let any oxygen in. It'll just pull in CO2. But people like Camera, the campaign for Royal Air would say that that's not real cast because you're bringing in non-natural CO2 in. How does that work? Is it another gas tap with yeah, some pretty like much. I mean, pressure? Like with the corny keg, you know, you pour it out because the CO2 is coming in. So they've just set up a system where, you know, you still have to vent it. You still get natural carbonation, but you're pulling in extraneous CO2, it's called. So cask beer was how beer was originally served. All beer was served this way until, until we invented, you know, pressurized serve and, and, sure. and moved away from that, which would have been, you know, I don't know the exact date, but somewhere between like 1880 and 1930-ish, we'd have started moving to keg because we'd have understand how to chill beer, how to create, you know, entirely sealed containers and stuff like that. Okay, I thought it was much later. I thought it was even like in the 60s and 70s that kegs sort of took over from cask. Oh, sorry, in terms off. of taking over, yeah. I mean, in the UK, cask wasn't dominated by keg until 18, uh, 1980. So yeah. cask was, was still more popular than keg beer as late as 1980, yeah. and then keg beer kind of took over. Yeah, exactly that, yeah. And, and now it's swung completely the other way, so it's, it's about 20% of the market in the UK is cask. 80% is, is keg. In terms of the taste of cask beer, is it filtered? Is it carbonated at all? So, I mean, it's a little bit gray, like some breweries will 
It's called packaging bright, so they'll let some CO2 over into the cask and then naturally carbonate the rest of the way. But a proper cask ale would be purely created by the yeast that's in that final cask. So it's all natural CO2. And then when it's vented and served, it's all natural CO2 that's pushing it out. So it's an entirely natural kind of process. Gotcha. It's only just finished conditioning, fermenting before it's served. But in terms of the difference between, you know, a beer on keg and a beer on cask, if it's the same beer, it's night and day, really. Like the level of carbonation is different. The density of the carbonation is very different as well. You know, these beers, they're not just lower carbs, they're also finer carbed. So it feels more smooth on the palate, yeah. even if it's, you know, got similar levels of CO2. And that is what is the one of the main joys about cask ale is the, the smoothness of that carbonation. Yeah. You then should get a fresher feel, and that's really hard to define. Like, what, what does freshness taste like? You know, we might know it with an IPA, it's about how much citrus oil is left and all this kind of stuff. But with a multi beer, what does that taste like? And that's where we start to talk about these ideas of like fresh bread and warm bread and kind of a Moorishness. And it's just, you know, when you have a really bang fresh vegetable or really bang freshly cooked steak or something like that, it's always going to taste better than when it's a couple of hours old. And that's the intangible but kind of vital part of cask. There's something about cask that is more visceral, exciting than yeah. some keg. Well, let's talk about how English people refer to beer. The pubs I've been to, the folks that I've talked to would say, like, the cask beer, they've just called an ale. And everything else has been a lager. Yet I've seen the ales on the, the lager taps. Is that a thing? Like, it is a thing. just sort of referred to as an ale and then non-cask beer is referred to as lager. It is a thing, but it shouldn't be. But it's a heritage of back there, when we had European lagers coming in in keg before the UK started producing kegged ales. Oh, sure. So anything that was on keg was a lager and anything in a cask was, was an okay. ale for probably about a decade, two decades. I've definitely seen ale and lager yeast used on the lager taps. But how about on the cask? Are there lager cask beers? Yeah, I mean, la lager is a yeast and it's a process of, of long storage. Sure. So you can definitely serve lagers on, on a cast tap. And there's some famous examples of that, in particular Shehallion, which is from a, a brewery up in, in Scotland called Harvey's Toon. They have a, a cask lager, which actually works pretty well. The interesting thing is that lagers are designed to be served cold and fresh and crushable. Sure. So when you're serving it at 10 to 12 degrees, like you would a cask ale, doesn't necessarily translate. So with certain beers, sure. it really works, but with some, it doesn't. So there's not many lagers on cask, but you can 100% have that. Yeah, so then let's talk about the temp differences between the ale and the lager, or the cask and the non-cask beers. I remember my middle school teacher, for whatever reason, telling a group of like 12 year olds, English people drink warm, flat beer. And we're <laughs> like, well, we, we don't even, we've never drank beer before, but interesting. <laughs> but really what they're referring to, I guess, is cask beer. And it's not warm and flat, but it's just not as cold and not as carbonated as, you know, draft beer. What temperature level are we talking here? Fahrenheit, bonus points. I don't think I'm gonna get bonus points. I, I like my cask at about 10 degrees. Celsius. Celsius. <laughs> this would be a cold Fahrenheit. That would be a very cold beer, <laughs> which I'm gonna say is about 50-ish 50 to 55, okay. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. Whereas, and, whereas like a draft beer would be, or a lager would be? Yeah, like between four and six. Okay, so 30 to 40. Like we would generally serve our beer at 40 degrees, yeah. or maybe just under. Cask is, is probably a, like twice as warm kind of thing if you're talking okay. in Celsius. And there's a couple of reasons for that. I mean, the main reason is tradition, you know. We keep our beers in UK pubs underground. Yeah, just in a basement. And that would have been kept there because it was cooler all year round that yeah. way. And the natural temperatures of that would have been probably more like between 12 and 16, depending on the time of year. Uh, and we started artificially chilling our beers to get it a little bit cooler because cooler beer is A, more refreshing, and B, cooler beer hides flavors more. So if you want your beer to be more crisp, you need a little bit less flavor. So it's really interesting with cask beer in that you'll get a lot more of the flavors that are in that beer by serving it at 10 to 12. So the warmer the beer is generally, the more flavor you really get. Like a really cold beer, something that you've cold crashed and you really aren't intending to serve it, but you're just sampling it, you know, it's near freezing. The flavors are very muted. And then as the beer warms up, the more flavor, yeah. the more I mean, the flavor. I mean, it's why you get pops. Heineken extra cold, Guinness extra cold. These are beers for people that don't necessarily want to taste what they're going to be drinking. It's, <laughs> yeah. it, it's A, so it's colder for longer, but it's B, so that you, you taste less of it. Whereas with cask ale, people want to taste everything that they're going to taste. And, and for better or for worse, because that also has the curse that a lot of beer in the UK is served too warm, you know, and you okay. start to taste stuff that you don't want to taste. It goes off quicker when it's stored at those temperatures. Sure. You know, that's why a lot of the cliches around cask exist, because people have come to the UK, they've drunk a pint and it's been served at 16 degrees. And you're like, 
why is this as warm as a red wine, as flat as a red wine, okay. and starting to oxidize much quicker because oxidation happens quicker at, at higher temperatures. So it's a real tight rope to walk. You've got this live beer in cask being exposed to oxygen, and you're starting to serve it at temperatures that aren't necessarily at the best for the beer, even if okay. it's best for the serve. Caring for this means really looking after how much oxygen, what temperatures, and how long it's on tap for, which just isn't true of keg beer. So like, what would be the maximum amount of time that a cask would last in a bar? I mean, it, it would depend entirely on the brewery and the style, but... If they're following best practices... If they're following best practice, you should have a beer last three to four days. Maximum. Maximum. Yeah. And then it's got to go. And then, yeah, I mean, most pubs will start to ditch it, I think. So I talked to somebody at another, what do you go, like you refer to a bar, a pub, tavern? All of them are wonderful. You can okay. apply what you, what you prefer. We're in a pub now. For okay, sure. pub. For sure. And the difference and being? I, I, th I, think it, I think it's the vibe. I think it's the beer that's served. I think it's whether there's lots of fridge options as well. Okay. It's yeah. A, okay. a public house. It's a place that anyone can come and feel welcome. And that should be true of a bar as well, but that was sure. the original idea of a pub. Tavern being then what? Uh, I think it's a bit of an American, isn't it? I don't know about tavern. You the, guys we, got like Paddy's Pub and <laughs> taverns and shit like that. We don't have those. <laughs> Paddy, I want to go to Philly just to drink <laughs> But like taverns is not a thing, right? No, we, we have mm -hmm. inns and an inn in theory would be a place you can sleep over okay, as well. Okay, I was going to say, yeah. Like Whereas, a, yeah, a tavern, yeah, I think is either an Americanism or yeah. a Barcelization of a term Maybe that was used like for something. Maybe it's like a boarding house type situation. So like a country a pub might be a tavern. No one, no one, say, no one says tavern. There's a guy out there who knows about this and they're going to write a comment <laughs> oh on this my God. video that's about five pages And I look forward long. to it. I look forward <laughs> to reading that comment. So what is the minimum shelf life for a cask? But if you don't vent it, if you don't start letting that CO2 out, yeah. it can last as long as a keg beer, really. It's a sealed container. There's only so much sugar it can ferment. There's no reason to think that a cask ale, and this is the interesting thing because it's supposed to be like tap fresh, it's supposed to be the freshest it can be, but you, you could just keep it as long as a keg beer if you want. Okay, so I read somewhere, and I don't know if this is true or not, now that I've been here, I don't think it's true. I read somewhere that people would mix old and new casks. So like as one cask was like, oh, past such prime, they would just pour a half a pint of that and then mix it with half a pint of the new and serve it up to people. Is that something? 100% true. Thing? It doesn't it's happen true. now. It is true. Um, it was true. That, that was how a lot of beer was served. So back in the 19th century, okay. you, you'd have had what, what was called the mild beer which was the very fresh beer that wouldn't have... So it would have finished fermenting with traditional Saccharomyces yeast. But in the UK, before we, before we discovered what yeast did, before we discovered that we could isolate yeast and only use certain strains, all beer would have turned wild eventually. It would have all been a slightly infected. So the mild ales okay. were served before that secondary fermentation started happening. And so you drink it fresh, it would be sweeter, it would be less funky, it would be fresher. And then you had what was called stale beer, which had been fermented by Britannomyces, which oh, was much wow. drier. Wow, which is really, just a really like a wild ale. Yeah, so it'd be funky. They pretty much knew how to stop like Lactobacillus pediococcus kicking in. So they stopped it going sour, but Brett would really take hold because, you know, hops okay. stops Lactobacillus exactly. and pediococcus. Sure. Doesn't stop Brett. Sure. So all these beers would turn bretty and Dude, funky. Brett, unstoppable T-shirt idea for you guys. Exactly. There's a festival in the in in uh, the Netherlands called Brett will eat anything. So you'd have this mild ale that wouldn't have any funk and would be less alcoholic, sweeter. You'd then have the stale beer that had been you know left long enough that the Brett had kicked in and that would be funky, you know, complicated, interesting beer, higher alcohol, longer aging time, and all that meant it cost more because you had to store it, right? Generally, the working classes would drink mild. The landed classes would drink the stuff they could afford, the stales, the higher ABV stuff, then some people would blend the two in pubs. How lucky the lower class was at that point. Like, I felt like those beers would have been the, <laughs> the beers though. Um, so then speaking of the types of people who drink the different types of beer currently, who drinks what? Who drinks lager beer? Who drinks ale? Who drinks draft beer? Modern draft beer? Who drinks the cask? So, I mean, beer? everybody drinks lager. Lager is about just over 70% of what's drunk in the UK. 70% of the beer sold in the UK is macro okay. lager. 30% of it is not. Within that, we have 20% okay. of cask. We then have 10% left over, which is keg ale, but not considered craft. So you've got stuff like John Smith's, Guinness. So like 10% of 30, like 3% of people we're talking about. No, 10% of the total volume. Insert oh, math. Really? Yeah. <laughs> it's a, it's a great Brutal assessment. <laughs> of all the beer that's drunk in the UK, 70% is macro lager, 20% is cast, 10% is kegged ale or lager. And then we have four to five percent of that 10% is craft. So small batch, exciting, unusual beer. It could be lager 
could be ale, could be wild ale, could be whatever. Which maybe is why your macro lager video shot through the Exactly. Roof. And we're living off that shit. Thank you, macro <laughs> beer. <laughs> so cask beer, what I've been told by several people is that like the, the older folks, so the, the last generation, those are the people who are really hanging on to the cask beer. They're right to some extent. Cask ale is declining. And that's why on the Craft Beer Channel, we've done Keep Cask Alive because we want, you know, it should be flying in this age where we're more interested in providence, in independence, in sustainability, ethical practice of businesses. You know, if you buy a cask ale, you're very likely supporting a small business where yeah. every pint that you buy, there's somebody at the top of that chain going, thank fuck, we sold a beer, you know? Whereas, you know, that's not true of macro beer. And so it should be really flying, but because of the issues of how hard it is to serve, it's a bit of a struggle. A lot of the older drinkers, you know, they come from a time when car scale was a bit more reliable. They come from when it was drunk as the main drink. You know, it's very much a cliche that it's an older person's drink, but it has been. And what we've tried to do and what lots of breweries are trying to do, you know, you have some of the UK's best breweries now producing casks because they love it as a format. They understand the benefits of this oven fresh kind of beer and the, sure. the benefits it can lead yeah. lead to. So they're trying to serve cask and go, look, we shouldn't let this die because yes, a New England IPA isn't at its best presented this way. But if you want any other style of beer in the UK, it's probably going to be better on cask. So we need to protect it. And I quite literally see the job of the Craft Beer Channel in the UK at least as explaining cask ale is the best way to present so many beer styles and it needs yeah. to stay. This has been an amazing experience. Thank you so much for having me here, taking me around, giving me recommendations, showing me the ribs. This is my first real experience with cask beer and I absolutely love it. I thank everybody, Phil, Johnny, Brad. Thank you guys, I appreciate it. Thank you, this cheers. This is an amazing beer style. Everybody, everybody should try this. Okay, <laughs> <laughs>